And what I want to talk about tonight specifically is one of those one night stands. And that's the Glessner House in Chicago. This is a, if you don't know it, it's a ponderous, heavy stone fortress of a building. I'm showing you three pictures of the street level facade. Um, and at the very bottom on the right, I'm showing you the, the floor plan of the house, the first level floor plan. Um, it's on a corner. So both sides, the, um, the left and the bottom are streets. So this thing, this thing maintains that quarter, corner with that kind of stone facade. In the middle row, I'm showing you the front facade, still very somber. You enter into that house and what you are greeted with is this incredibly beautiful, soft, luxurious, gilded age slash arts and crafts, Romanesque interior. It is just an extraordinary building with extraordinary artifacts throughout. Now, when I stay there for this one night stand, and I tell you that every single object was beautiful, every surface, piece of furniture, every piece of tile, the wall surfaces, the woodworking, everything. It was, it was like a wedding banquet. It was overload. It, it was just incredibly luxurious. Now, I just want to remind you what that exterior facade was. And, and you very clearly got a sense that this house was about somehow keeping the outside out and maintaining the interior space as something special and unique. It was truly a womb-like space. Well, I'm showing you now the bedroom that I slept in. This was the guest bedroom. Um, and the bottom picture is the morning after me sleeping in that bedroom. I'm, I'm not really concentrating on the Glessner house itself, even though, as you can tell, I wrote a blog post and you can go um, on Twisted Preservation and read it. I'm reading, I'm writing the blog post as I'm looking out that window. Um, what I really am interested in this conversation is in the morning in making coffee, I left those luxurious rooms and I started to enter into the servant's wing. The first picture is from the dining room. And then you walk through the ante room and you get to the kitchen. You walk through the kitchen and there is tucked in the back corner of the house, this little room with a table and you look out the window. And in fact, this was so inviting that that's where I sat and there's my cup of coffee. And I looked out into this cloistered space, this cloistered garden space. Because remember, the exterior is this castle and the inside is this very soft porous feeling. Well, the reason why this became so important and I didn't realize it at the time was while I was sitting there drinking my coffee, the executive director came in asking me if I wanted um, some more coffee. And he started to explain to me how excited they were because they had just found out that the brick and tile work were made in Zanesville, Ohio. And this is interesting because Glessner, the owner of the house, um, was born in Zanesville and they were still investigating it. Well, as I was surrounded by all of this tile and now finding out that it was made in Zanesville, something clicked. And I, I, I knew a little bit about this region of Ohio, um, and I started to ask him more and more questions. And I'm just showing you in the red dot in the middle of Ohio, Zanesville, and this area of Ohio is known as the Clay Belt. It's the reason why so much American tile and brickwork at the period um, came out of Ohio. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that and why that matters in this discussion. I need to pause for a moment 
because when he told me that the tile work came from Zanesville, there was a moment in my mind that I was taken out of where I thought I was in the Glessner house, I was in the Gilded Age, and I was studying um, and researching the Glessners and that house. But what it did is it pulled me out of that particular time period, and it pulled me out of that particular place. So I'll need everybody to take a deep breath, shake their head a bit. And now as I'm sitting in that tiled room in the very back of the Glessner kitchen, I'm gonna take you to a different place. So I'm gonna take you to something that is very personal and the reason for the talk this evening. My family, both sides of my family, one from Rome and one from Palermo, immigrated in the early 1900s and ended up in an extraordinarily small town called Shawnee, Ohio. Now, my family never talked much about our immigration, nor did they ever tell me why we ended up in Shawnee, Ohio. And pictures of Shawnee, Ohio, and I'm showing you on the left in the middle row, that is downtown Shawnee. On the right, I'm showing you Palermo. And so one side of my family immigrated from Palermo and went to Shawnee. And then of course, like many of us on this call, they traveled by boat to get to the United States. And then once they arrived, they took the train. And it seemed odd to me that you would take a train from the East Coast out to Shawnee, Ohio. Well, I really didn't know that much about Shawnee because my family didn't talk about it. I didn't really know much about my great parent, great grandparents because they didn't talk about it. I'm showing you here an aerial photograph of Shawnee, Ohio. This is Shawnee right here. In investigating after going to the Glessner house and looking to the Zanesville area, I realized that Shawnee was less than 30 minutes away from Zanesville. And in, in getting oral histories from my family, I realized that my great grandfather worked in a brick and tile factory in Shawnee, Ohio, in the clay belt. This is Claycraft, which is the name of the factory. My family immigrated directly into an area of Shawnee called Italyville. And I'm showing you here this red line. This red line where it's the um, city limits of Shawnee, it was dictated that Italian immigrants could only live outside of the city limits and live in Italyville. I'm showing you here a photograph, which is the only photograph I have of the family at that time. My grandfather, who every day his entire life when he, once he moved to Shawnee, walked from his house in Italyville on the railroad tracks, and I'm showing you down here on the bottom, avoiding up here on the top, walking through downtown, walking to the clay craft tile and brick site and walking home. And in fact, my mother tells a story of her grandfather always carrying a black lunchbox. Um, his wife never learned English, so he would take notes every day at the Claycraft factory. And when he came home over dinner, my grandmother said that he would speak to her in English and Italian and explain what happened during the day. It was her only Italian conversation at the time. This was his existence. I also found out after the Glessner House one night stand that the reason why he walked on the railroad tracks is because of the discrimination that the Italian immigrants felt that they couldn't walk through downtown. So he had to walk to and from via the railroad tracks. We did not have a picture of the house that they lived in 
Um, and this is the only photograph that I was able to get in my research. As you can tell, the house was not preserved. It is now um, just a um, mess, it's just a heap. And, and so it became really important to me to understand this level of bigotry against Italians during this time. And this is from a newspaper editorial from the same area of the clay belt in Ohio. The experiment of importing them, the Italian immigrants, into the Hocking Valley will prove a costly one. As a rule, Italian laborers are ignorant and vicious. They know nothing of our language and seem to be incapable of learning it. Very few of them know enough to read and write their own language. Now, of course, this is just one editorial of many. I also investigated Chicago at the time, um, and there were several articles, one in particular stood out, um, that said that Sicilians, and mind you, I'm Sicilian, um, that Sicilians were only good for cleaning up horse debris on the streets. Um, and I found this photograph of an Italian immigrant as a street cleaner. At the top, I'm showing you a photograph of Italian immigrant clay and brick workers at the clay craft factory. Again, seeing the larger picture of what it meant to buy bricks and tile from the clay belt in Ohio. After doing this research, I contacted the Glessner House and I said, could you please do some investigating? Can you tell me about the servants in the houses? And so they did, they sent me back a long spreadsheet around 40 years worth of notations by Mrs. Glessner. She noted everything about each servant. From 1888 to 1928, and I'm showing you one of the books, out of 40 years of servants, 157 servants, not a single one was of Italian descent. There wasn't a single name of Italian descent. In fact, most of them were Irish, there was one name that seemed out of place. They investigated it and it was Lithuanian. <clears throat> and so what this did do to me was not only become interested in the servants at the Glessner house, but particularly the Italian immigrants who weren't allowed inside of the Glessner house. Now this was really strongly felt by me because here I am, Sicilian Italian immigrant family sleeping in their guest bedroom, having free reign of the Glessner house and writing about it on my blog. And in investigating, and I think you probably have seen these photo, these two famous photographs, this is the floor plan again of the Glessner house. The red is the main house. This is where I slept. This was for three people. This entire half of the house, all of the floors were for servants. They had at sometimes 10 servants to serve these three or four people. And it, it was interesting to me to make the direct comparison between a tenement at the time that could hold probably 10 to 12 people and these are at generally the same scale. So as luxurious as that house was and has as spacious as I felt, mind you, this is the stair hall in the Glessner house. The stair hall is right here. You can get a sense of the scale of one immigrant's house. <laughs> 